heads. Thank you, Lord, for your wonderful goodness. Thank you for another beautiful day and the opportunity to serve you again. We pray for your blessing in this class. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, good morning, class. Our study this morning will have to do with the Millerites and the Sabbath keepers who rejected the counterfeit priesthood that was developed by uh, Darby in England and which controlled the whole English movement from that time on. It is of interest that it was just when Darby uh, was substituting his futurism uh, for the historicist position. It was just at that time that God called Miller. <coughs> and William Miller, to begin with, took two years to study. He began as a deist who had decided that perhaps there was in Scripture an answer to his soul's needs. And he decided that if this was true, then it must be possible to harmonize the different statements of uh, Scripture, which he and his friends had made fun of as being contradictory. So he set himself to reconciling the different passages of Scripture and came to the conclusion as a result that Christ would be coming in, uh, not, not in October 22, I'm sorry, that Christ would be coming about 1843. And uh, his purpose then from that time for the next five years was to answer every problem that could be lodged against his understanding of that. And so he spent five years in extended study, a further five years, after that, he kept waiting for someone to arise and preach that message. He felt the message was very important, but did not consider that he, a farmer, could possibly preach it. And uh, so he was waiting for someone. On August 13, he was in his study, uh, wrestling with God, who was giving the message to go tell it to the world. And on August 13, he finally surrendered and said, All right, Lord, if you want me to, to present this message, if somebody comes and, and asks me to preach, I'll do it. Mm. Now, at this point, he was quite sure that he was off the hook. <laughs> no one had ever asked him to do this. In all this period of time, no one had suggested that he'd do it. But within an hour, his nephew appeared at the door and knocked at the door. He, when he went there, he says, my father has sent me to tell you that our pastor is away this week and wants you to come and present your message to the people. Well, that, it was a, a shock to him and he sought earnestly to get free from his commitment. Mm -hmm. So he went out and prayed about it. And uh, that was impossible because God had led him to make that decision. And when he finally reconciled himself to it, he was exceedingly happy. The result was that at Dresden, 13 miles distant, he did have the Sunday service but the people were so uh, responsive to it that they wanted him to stay on and continue to present it more fully. So he spent a week there uh, presenting to the people and when he finally returned home, he found in the mail another invitation to speak. And from that time on, he was has constant sequence of invitations and eventually he was 
unable to fill them all. He took as many as he could. And, uh, but the important thing to note here is that the Millerites were true historicists. They believed that the 2300 days represented 2300 years and it started in 457 because they did not understand the problem of no zero date. They were off by one year. If there had been a zero date, it would have been, they would have been more accurate. But, uh, but the, the way it is, uh, they assumed that it would be about 1843. In reality, it was 1844, which they would discover later. So the Millerites refused to connect with the Darbyites, the Futurites, Futurists, who, by the way, would like to have joined them because they would have been happy to move that toward Futurism. Their message now was very different than it was before. And uh, I've got great disappointment. That should be great disappointment. Kept many uh, after the disappointment many kept setting dates. Every six months or so they'd set a new date and then that date would pass and they'd set a new date and they continued to do that. Others became involved in the concept of the Jews returning to Palestine and uh, reconstructing the altar and the sanctuary and that uh, they would reestablish the ceremonial system. Now the Sabbath group was protected against this because they clung to the conviction that the 2300 days representing 2300 years and that they ended in October 22. As a matter of fact, Ellen White, Ellen Harmon at the time her first vision was on the midnight cry, confirming the date October 22, 1844. Now, of those pastors who joined Miller, first a few and then more and more, those that stand out and you should remember are Joshua V. Hines, who was the organizer I think we discussed that before, didn't we, in one of our classes? Maybe it's one yet to come. At any rate, Joshua V. Himes was, became Miller's organizer. He asked Miller one day when he came to his church, uh, his Boston church, he said, How, uh, why aren't you going to the cities? He said, no one has invited me. He was only going to where he was invited. He said, if you were invited, would you go? He said, yes, I certainly would. So Joshua Himes took the responsibility of being his event man who would move ahead, who would secure appointments. And he secured many appointments in the various cities. So this changed Miller's whole approach so that he was reaching large masses of people instead of just a few. Josiah Litch was also very important, who, who became uh, the editor of the Signs of the Times, which Joshua Himes had started. And then uh, I think Josiah Litch was the first employed person. And uh, then Charles Fitch is another who's known for two things. For the 1843 chart, and also for his call out of Babylon. He's the one that, that began applying uh, the uh, second angel's message to when the churches began to close their doors. Uh, he saw in that the need for the second angel's message. At first, William Miller and the other leaders uh, refused to become involved in that, but eventually they too begin to preach.
that was their commitment not to become involved in, in developing a new church. But they did begin to see that the second angel's message applied. And then, of course, Samuel S. Snow was the one who originally, after the, the uh, great disappointment, there was a, another setting in the spring of 1844. And uh, when that passed and nothing, uh, nothing took place, uh, Samuel, uh, Samuel Snow brought to the people, which I think we'll be studying in later or two, but Samuel Snow was the one who brought the midnight cry that according to the Kairite calculation, October 22, 1844 would be the day of atonement for that year. And so they began preaching 1844. Now, the, the Sabbath keeping group uh, saw in Revelation 10 and 11 evidence that there would be a great disappointment. You remember that's the story in Revelation of the angel that uh, comes with great light and has in his hand a book open. That book was a symbol of the book of Daniel. And that uh, book uh, was the book with, with chapter 8, 14 at 2300 days. And uh, then it says that, that um, the angel told John to eat this book up and said it will be in your mouth sweet as honey, but in your belly it will be bitter. So he took the book and ate it up and indeed it was sweet like honey, but became very bitter. Now this was a symbol or a portrayal of the great disappointment. Not only that, but immediately after it, it said, you have to prophesy again. And chapter 11 tells him he must prophesy again. And, and uh, verse 11, and chapter 11, 1 says, there was given to me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise, measure the temple of God. And then dwell therein. Now, to measure something, you'd have to know where it was to measure it. So this really was a challenge to study the sanctuary message, which they did. Hiram Edson, as a matter of fact, on the first morning after the disappointment, uh, he and his friends had breakfast together, and uh, he decided to, to go out and visit the believers and encourage them after he had had an earnest prayer that morning he had the assurance that that soon God was going to reveal to them what was wrong with their calculations and as he was walking through the field presumably with Crozier somebody else was with him and it presumably was Crozier as he was going through the fields, he saw in his mind's eye Christ moving from the holy place to the most holy place. And it occurred to him that the sanctuary was not on earth but in heaven. And uh, that they should study the sanctuary. And by the way, the last verse in Revelation 11 Verse 18 says the temple of God was open in heaven. So that chapter itself directs their minds to that. There were three men who studied together. Hiram Edson studied with F.B. Hahn, Dr. Hahn, and O.R.L. Crozier. They studied for weeks. When they had finished their study, they chose Crozier, who was a writer and an editor, uh, to uh, prepare the results for printing. And uh, his first publication was in 1845 in the Day Dawn, and then again in 46, an expanded 
uh, issue of the same study was presented in a day star extra so it was a different paper but but it was a paper that was devoted entirely to this subject so it was that uh, God led the believers step by step and notice it was this October 22 and the certainty of it uh, and uh, as I said before Ellen Harmon had a vision midnight cry vision affirming this however at this point Hiram Edson did not know Ellen Harmon and she didn't know Edson nor did either one of them know uh, 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 Bates and here's the uh, Ellen Harmon says I saw the father rise from the throne and in a flaming chariot go into the Holy of Holies within the veil and did sit and I saw and then it goes ahead with the description the last sentence says then I beheld Jesus as he was before uh, before the father a great high priest and uh, this letter of hers was published by Enoch Jacob in the Day Star which had just covered at this point in February had just printed the extra and now I presented there there were three men who were key there were three people I should say who were the initial three individuals who were to come together uh, Joseph Bates had read an article by Preble on the Sabbath and when he returned home and as he was walking across the little bridge to his home one of the people from the village said what's the good word Captain Bates and his answer was the good news is that the seventh day is a Sabbath and so he began proclaiming the Sabbath immediately then when uh, Joseph Bates uh, was proclaiming the Sabbath uh, Edson's uh, that is uh, Crozier's article in the Day Star Extra came out and he was so thrilled about that that he decided to go visit Hiram Edson uh, who had been the key person in that three people study so when he got there he gave the Sabbath message to Hiram Edson who had already read Preble's tract but had not accepted the Sabbath because he wanted to make sure uh, before accepting it that it was really uh, a message for that time and so it was that uh, uh, he accepted the Sabbath and Bates accepted the sanctuary so the two of them were involved now both of them had heard Ellen Harmon speak and neither one of them had felt inclined to accept it because they could not see how God would use a young girl like that whose health was so fragile and, and so forth so it took them a while however it about that time Hiram I should say Hiram actually did accept but Bates did not so Bates Hiram had three strands of a three strand rope and uh, Bates had only two and in the meantime Ellen Harmon uh, resisted accepting the Sabbath she did not resist the Sabbath truth itself but she could not believe that that was so important that they should make it a message and so for a period of time she resisted the Sabbath while Bates who had heard her speak resisted accepting the spirit of prophecy because he could not see how it was now notice 
all three men did some resisting and all three men did accept except resistance is not wrong when we're honestly seeking to make sure we're in the right as a matter of fact it is a very important principle which I have followed through the years never ever accept something new because it seems foolproof when you first hear it uh, the, every kind of counterfeit if presented carefully and in, in, uh, uh, in the way that will be most convincing can appear to be foolproof but uh, all of them when they really saw the light of truth did accept it a fourth person was involved in the initial leadership and that was James White James White was an interesting person he had been a preacher in the Advent movement and had been ordained as a, uh, as a minister and uh, when James uh, learned about Ellen Harmon he decided that it was his responsibility to accompany and protect her now there was no sense of romance in his thoughts at all but he felt that a young lady of this kind needed a protector she always had a female accompanist her sister or someone else always went with her uh, but uh, but James uh, also accompanied her and when they began to hear rumors that some were speaking about their relationship in a questionable way uh, James realized they either need to get married or he needed to cease to accompany her so uh, uh, they prayed she he prayed about it and then talked with her and she prayed earnestly about it and they believed the Lord intended for them to be together and the only basis upon which James felt that this continued could continue would be if they were married and so it was in in uh, August of 1846 that they were married and very soon after they were married they began re-reading Bates's study on the Sabbath and both of them became convinced that this was indeed a part of the present truth message and so it was that uh, they now had the Sabbath and the sanctuary message as well as the gift of prophecy it was in November a little later at 46 that Ellen White was given a vision of the starry heavens and when she presented that vision before the people uh, she uh, uh, Bates was convinced that it had to be inspired because what she presented was just corresponded with what he an astronomer uh, and other key astronomers had concluded about various bodies in the heavens the interesting thing is that it was later discovered that it had to do with the moons around uh, Venus I think it was but at any rate later on they discovered more moons but this still did not discredit what Ellen White was saying because if she had seen all the extra moons Bates would not have been convinced because he would have thought she was wrong because he would have assumed that she was in error as it was he was convinced and so it was that all three stood in complete union but it's important to notice in the meantime that uh, they were in spiritual union before they were in theological union and that is extremely important our when we are 
struggling in the church with different opinions, different views of subjects, our first effort should be to come in union with the people we are uh, in disharmony with, whose views we are in disharmony with. We can question people's views, but when we question them, when we identify them with those views and resist them, it is a different thing, and that keeps, uh, maintains and increases division. And today we need to do the same thing. Now the principles that they've followed in developing this three-strand unit, uh, strands that unite in pursuit of truth, was that each person determines individually to discover truth. This is the vertical dimension we have spoken about before, that each, each individual connected directly uh, to God through his word and through the Holy Spirit. And yet all of them were joined in pleading for unity in the corporate body. And uh, they were, this is the horizontal dimension that we spoke about. This is the body of the church. And uh, we need to be constantly, every individual needs to be seeking truth. But we must always seek unity as we seek truth. And we need to realize that unless we seek unity in the spirit of unity, we will not find the truth that we want. From 1847 to sometime in 1849, there were Sabbath sanctuary conferences. This again illustrates the uh, priesthood of believers, where they would come together and study. Now I mentioned before their protection against futurism by Revelation 10 and 11 and the uh, sanctuary message. Uh, but they were not immune from another uh, error, and that was the error of assuming that all organization results in Babylon. So by applying the second angel's message to organization itself, rather than to coming out from the churches that resist the message. Uh, they uh, were in serious error, but, uh, and so many of our people uh, were very opposed to organization. And this was in the air they breathed. In other words, this, this was a part of the Advent thinking. The different, this is what had the message they had just been preaching, come out of her, my people. And when they said come out of her, they were also determined not to organize, and they thought of any organization as being papal and resulting in becoming Babylon. Of course, the, the uh, fact they had been cast out of the churches caused them to believe that uh, it, they not only believed that the churches were Babylon, but that organization was Babylon. And as a result of this, they had serious problems organizing. It was not until 1863, nearly two decades after the disappointment, that they finally organized. And in the next few minutes, we will share a little bit about the process. Even key leaders were often approached. What's that? Where did... I think it's the last line. I just can't see it. 1863, yes. So, the PB represents priesthood of believers. PB? Does that represent for the brethren? No. Uh, so, in other words, like the Plymouth Brethren of England, they'd concluded that organization always opposes truth, which is not true. God 
is a God of organization and all heaven is organized. However, it is true that Satan seizes upon organization uh, to control the body and oftentimes like the papal, the papacy developed as a result of seizing control. But I want you to notice it was not the same organization anymore. That organization of the church was reorganized by Constantine, a heathen ruler. He claimed to be converted but refused to be baptized until he was on his deathbed because he wanted to be sure that when he died his sins would all be forgiven. So whatever sins he committed in the meantime he wanted to be included in his baptism which is a very superstitious and false concept and an indication that he was not really eager to be transformed in nature but just eager to make sure that his sins were covered whatever they were as a matter of fact he was a very wicked man many also held the Plymouth Brethren view that even to adopt a name would become Babylon. So they should have no. You see, the brethren, you remember? They call themselves brethren because they refuse to take a name. Uh, we're just the brothers, brethren. And then the Plymouth Brethren came into being because Darby uh, set up his uh, chapel in Plymouth in opposition to, to noon and uh, in purposely to, to uh, subvert his organization. Others argued that the time was too short, that if they organized, they would be denying their own faith. But through James and Ellen White, God led them to organize and the name was uh, was uh, secured as early as 1860. Review and Herald and the Michigan Conference both were organized in 61. But it was not until 1863 that we became a denomination. It was James who, the through the necessity of his own experience, sensed that there must be an organization. And uh, we mentioned here the experience of James, who uh, had uh, worked in the fields uh, to be able to attend the sanctuary meetings, uh, the Sabbath sanctuary meetings, and assumed that he must do so again in order to secure money for the paper it was in 1849 that Ellen White, uh, uh, White by this time had a vision of a little paper that would circle the earth and said you must write, write, write. But here he was about ready to go out to, to uh, reap, find a job where he could reap the fields and uh, Ellen was given this vision stating that he should write that the Lord would not strengthen him now to reap the fields like he did before and that he must walk out by faith. So instead of taking the scythe, James began to write. Now James had no money and no resources. So what is he going to do? Well, he found a a printer in Middletown, a few miles away, who was willing to print his first present truth, an eight-page present truth. And uh, with no money down, he was willing to do that for a total stranger. James had never met him, but the Lord impressed this printer that he should do that with the idea that money would come in and that it would be cared for. And so it was in 49, the first present truth was published at Middletown. And they used, he had have to, to carry the heavy load of, of papers 
in a saddlebag uh, back and forth, uh, that is from the, from the print shop home, uh, to be able to, to trim it and then mail it out. It was a tremendously uh, uh, wearisome process. But in the, in the next year, in 1850, he was impressed that he ought to expand this and make it broader, and that he should reach out to the people who had been a part of the Advent movement. So he decided to have the paper called uh, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. And this Advent Review means that he would review the different uh, positions taken during the Advent movement. And then he would also present the Sabbath truths. As he did this, he was uh, impressed by the Lord to call upon the readers to send in money to cover the paper, which did happen. It wasn't very long before he was able to get a hand press and begin to doing the uh, paper himself. So the, this required workers, and there were a number of workers involved in, the, in their little press. They were all living right together in the White's home. They had to rent a building large enough to accommodate themselves and several pressmen with no salaries. So the Lord put it upon their hearts to, to do this. But in the meantime, uh, they needed to organize so they wouldn't be in that kind of situation where they were, uh, had no, no funds to carry on, no means. And I've put here, God waited patiently until his leaders were united and they working as a priesthood with the people before he brought into their midst uh, organization. So it's important to notice that God called first for a rest restoration of the priesthood of believers. And when they were functioning as a priesthood of believers, then he was able to lead them in the organizing, organizing process. As a matter of fact, the very process was a means of developing the priesthood of believers. So, uh, and there was conflict, which we will speak about further. Conflict then and conflict now. Conflict is allowed by the Holy Spirit and by God uh, to cause us to depend more and more upon the Holy Spirit who alone can unite us and to guide us. When Jesus promised the Spirit, he said, he, when he the Spirit has come, he will lead you into what? All truth. He will guide you into all truth. Only the Holy Spirit can unite us in truth. Now, uh, Ellen White spoke to her husband, says, the Lord has shown me that if you call the ministers together and have J. N. Andrews come up from Wakan and hold a Bible class, you will find that, that in the scriptures there is a complete plan for sustaining the work of the ministry. So notice what God did. He did not, in the testimonies, organize them. What he did was to direct their action encouraging them to organize. Notice this is the priesthood process that is being called for. Call the people together and do what? And have Jan Andrews come from Walcott and what is he to do? He is to hold a Bible class and together they will find in scriptures a complete plan for sustaining gospel ministry. So where was that plan to be found? In scripture, and it was to be found as a corporate group, not as simply 
She didn't say call Jane Andrews and have him tell the people what to do. He is to be the one to lead them in a Bible study and that Bible class was to provide the scriptural evidence of a complete plan that God had for sustaining the ministry. Now, this was, again, this was not, it was only to direct action. It was not as a substitute for scriptural principles and certainly no substitute for priesthood of believer principles. No person is controlling. The Holy Spirit is to guide them together. As a matter of fact, it is in the process of developing the priesthood of believers that we most fully learn to depend on the Holy Spirit. Now, as a result of their work, they develop what is called, they used to call affectionately Sister Betsy. Now, what was Sister Betsy? Systematic benevolence was the plan. It was not quite yet a tithing plan that would come a little later, but it was a plan for everyone to participate together in raising the funds necessary. And what they did, instead of a regular tithe, they suggested that for all that a person is worth, whatever they, their net worth is, they would give 1% of that to the, as offerings. And uh, the women were given a certain amount, which was less than the men because they did not have the earning, earning power of the man. And children were given a smaller portion yet because they would have much less earning power. But all, everyone was involved in securing funds for the ministry. Now, this was one of the key steps that was taken in the development of the organization. Now, the question of the name was a very serious issue because the, many of the people and some of the leaders had been teaching that if they took a name, they would become Babylon. But the fact is, the Lord, through the Holy Spirit, in their priesthood process, convinced them that they must have a name. Now, why would they have to have a name? No one knew better than James White, because James White was the one I see it's not quite here yet, but we'll go ahead with it. James White was the one who was responsible for all, virtually every major thing the organization was doing. The uh, Present Truth and the Review and Herald, and then later on, uh, Youth Instructor, and so forth. Then the later yet still would be Signs of the Times but all of the church's property were in his hands. And that may sound like a, a wonderful thing, but it was a terrible thing because he became responsible for all of the church's uh, dealings. And when people would want to send in money as a loan, which they often did, they would demand that he himself take the responsibility so that he himself became responsible for the money. And uh, at least in one case, a fairly wealthy woman was loaning some money and he sent the money back because she insisted that he take personal responsibility and he said, no, this is not personal thing. This is for the for the movement. So it was necessary to have a name in order to organize. In order to have a legal organization, he would need to organize. So the name was chosen in 1860. 
But despite the fact that God gave a vision approving of this, uh, the, across the field there are many who were accusing the leaders of becoming Babylon. And uh, not only that, but they made personal accusations against James White because he was, he and Ellen, Helen, his wife, were the ones urging um, union and an organization. And they accused him of trying to establish himself as the president. Uh, and uh, James, of course, had no such thought in mind, but, but they insisted. Now, there were many attacks that took place during this period of time on James and Ellen. In December 14, at the end of that year, their little son Herbert dies. And on the 23rd, Ellen was, had serious pain over her heart and repeatedly fainted. And in that state was given a vision. It was a clear, she was told to send a clear testimony to the opposers of this movement to let them know that this was not something, their position was not something that the Lord was leading them in. It was God himself who was directing them into organization. So in March 1861, the first confession came from Roswell F. Cottrell, who was one of the editors of the, sign of the Review and Herald. And he had been opposing uh, this movement from within the Review. In other words, as, as one of the editors of the Review, he had opposed this. So in March of 1861, uh, he made his confession in May the 3rd of the same year, the Publishing Association was formed, and in May 23, they had already formed, and now they adopted the bylaws for that. See, the review was the most significant thing it, that was on James' heart. James was afraid that he would um, have a heart attack or something himself. He knew he was not well and that he was in danger of having a breakdown. And so this is one of the reasons why he and his wife were so adamant about organization. In September 3, 1861, is after the name was selected but during that period of time, there was a great opposition, especially in northern uh, parts, uh, northeastern part of the United States, of Maine and New Hampshire and so forth. Uh, he wrote in the, in the review, we are done moving out in any enterprise connected with the cause until system can lie at the bottom of our operations. Now, let others choose to push the battle in confusion, but we are making all preparations for a safe retreat till the army of Sabbath keepers be organized and the rebels against the organization be purged out. So although Ellen White sent this message to the leaders and, and, uh, and it was accepted by most of them, there was still opposition. In fact, one whole conference had uh, voted to, uh, and other several conferences voted to, to reject the name and the organization. When, when James White expressed this concern that he would have to leave, and by the way, this was not just because he said, if you don't play my game, I'm not going to play with you. His whole life was at stake, and he knew it. 
uh, he was under tremendous pressure. But in, a, in October 5 of that same year, 1861, the Michigan Conference, the Battle Creek leaders had taken responsibility and they called the Michigan Conference together and they voted uh, to organize the Michigan Conference. And so that Michigan Conference was the first conference to be organized. They also uh, they also voted to encourage the other states to do likewise, to, to organize and forming their own conferences. In the meantime, James was accused of seeking control, but more than that, he was accused of financial wrongdoing. And the fact is that the Battle Creek folk did what was, was well to do. They assumed the responsibility of, of defending James White, whom they knew was absolutely un honest. Their means of doing that was to form a committee of some of the most respected men. So three of the most respected men formed a committee and, and in the review, they announced that anyone who had anything against him were to write the details of their complaint and send it in to this, this committee. And this, in, the same, uh, art, in the same review, it was announced that May 20, they would meet together to consider forming a general conference to bring all of the different groups together. And on the back page of that review, James himself wrote a note appealing to anyone who knew of his financial wrongdoings to send in to the committee. So he himself urged that. And uh, as a result, uh, there were many who, uh, who wrote in, but not one of them made any claims against him. Those who had been making the claims did not have any real evidence. They were suspecting, suspicious. But all the letters that came in were letters of endorsement that testimonies in behalf of James of what he had done for them. As a matter of fact, oftentimes the very people who made these complaints were people James had generously helped. And they assumed that he must be a, have his hand in the till in order to do that. But actually James was one of our greatest businessmen and wherever, wherever he went, he was constantly uh, selling something so that he would have money to carry on. Not that he would have money for his personal self, but that he would have money to travel and to be able to meet the appointments and also to help the various ministers and others who were in great need. And some of those then, because he was very generous, often offering things to himself, such as his own horse. So he walked while others rode. Uh, and uh, when the General Conference did meet, they did form the General Conference and uh, they, during that session, tried to get James several times, they tried to get him to become the, their president, but he refused. He knew. As he said, this would just be fodder and, and for the, 
for his opponent, opponents. And instead, John Byington was elected the first General Conference president. But James was first uh, voted for him. And it was the second choice was uh, uh, Byington. So the Byington became our first president. Now, as the, as the uh, General Conference was organized, uh, one chapter of Adventist history was closed, another began, and would continue until the 1888 Minneapolis Conference. That there is conflict in God's church, that there will be, is inevitable because the church is the object of Satan's what? His special wrath. The dragon was wroth with the woman, Revelation 12, 17, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have what? A testimony of Jesus Christ. But <clears throat> I think we shared once before the process that went through during the Advent movement, what was the great focus? It was on Christ coming, wasn't it? Amen. And that was a very personal thing. They were eager to see him, not just for the second coming, but for his coming. But after the disappointment, when they began keeping the Sabbath, what do you suppose the opponents did? What, what was their focus? Their focus was to deny the law. The Sabbath is part of the law. We don't need to keep the Sabbath because the law is done away with. If you keep the Sabbath, their argument was then you become legalistic. What was our response? our response should have been to give, give even further focus upon Christ as the author of the law. But in reality, we became more and more focused upon text to prove that the law was still binding. And it was, and it is. But because there is so much evidence of that and because of the intense focus our people began to look forward to debate. At first we were challenged to debate and then they began challenging others to debate because they felt very secure. Now this was a, a self-centered mentality that was developing uh, in which they allowed their opponents to focus their own fi uh, vision on the law. So the, the law became their focus more than Christ himself. It was in 1852 that Ellen White first applied the Laodicean message to the Sabbath company. This was 11 years before they would be organized. At that time, in the review, Ellen White said she was shown that the message to the Laodiceans belonged to the Sabbath-keeping group. So God could see that already there was a change taking place in which the focus was shifted from uh, to their own individual uh, salvation and to obedience, which they began to think of as the basis for salvation, instead of Christ's righteousness as the basis of salvation. Even the second coming and re resurrection can be and was beginning to be self-centered because the focus was on my salvation rather than on Christ's righteousness. Now the two of those are not in conflict, but if we are focused on ourselves, that will result in conflict. 
as a result, a change began to take place in leadership and in the membership. As a matter of fact, as this change took place, the concept of priesthood of believers was lost. We no longer were focused on priesthood of believers because pride became a dominant factor in leadership as well as in membership. Even the emphasis upon the testimonies uh, was often self-centered and is today oftentimes because the focus is not so much on knowing Christ and his will as of determining exactly what are the requirements mm. and to be able to, what is the focus is really on security on our own security making sure that we have gone through all the hoops and so forth necessary for salvation when the assurance of salvation is very simple Christ is our righteousness if we really believe that and really receive his righteousness we can't receive his righteousness without receiving him and we cannot receive him and reject his principles so it's impossible to truly receive Christ as our righteousness without seeking to be like him. And this is the key. Because of that, Ellen White spoke of them as being, uh, the sermons as being as dry as the hills of Gilboa with neither dew nor rain. And uh, they had no intention of undermining uh, the grace of God and the focus upon it but they did what came naturally. They defended themselves instead of focusing on Christ. Now, they wanted to mention that their anti-Trinity focus, which James White had, Bates had, Andrews had, most of the key leaders had come from anti-Trinity. They identified Trinity with the papacy. Well, might they have identified it with the papacy because the papal concept of the Trinity was heretical. I think I've mentioned that before and we'll be mentioning it again later in more detail. But uh, the, the confusion on the Trinity resulted in confusion on the atonement. The anti-Trinitarian cannot accept Christ's divinity. Now, we do have anti-Trinitarians in the church today who accept Christ's divinity because it's so plain in the spirit of prophecy it cannot be rejected. But they insist that Christ was begotten of God somehow, is second and somehow the Father himself is the, is the superior being. By the way, that inevitably inevitably results in uh, plurality of gods, doesn't it? It was necessary for them to understand the Trinity before they can have adequate maturity uh, required by our message with the clarity of Christ's nature and the role and ministry of the Holy Spirit. It was it was Uriah Smith, however, who reset what I've called the wisdom of the body. In other words, the wisdom of the body would be what the denomination as a whole believed. <clears throat> when uh, Crozier denied atonement at the cross, he did so to uh, meet the arguments of the opponents of the sanctuary message who insisted that Christ's atonement was full and complete at the cross and that there was no further atonement. Now the idea that it was full and complete at the cross actually is true and we need to be very careful in uh, as we discuss things we differ from that we do not uh, deny that which is true in the other's arguments because even if the argument is false, oftentimes it will have elements of truth. Uh, 
in fact, without elements of truth, they would have no, no flight power, no ability to, to, to go anywhere. So, uh, as a result, Smith uh, reset. It was, first of all, let's notice that uh, in the article uh, that um, was written by, I said his name just now, what is it? Crozier, Crozier thank you. Slipped my mind just then. In Crozier's article, 46, he gave a number of arguments against atonement at the cross, saying that there was no atonement at the cross. This he did to counter those who insisted that all atonement was the cross and there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. Now he went too far, however, in doing that, and our early leaders did not accept his position his position on that. Our early leader, leaders did believe in atonement at the cross, but later it was J. H. Wagner, the father of E. J. Wagner, who led, first of all, for the first time in about 1854 or five, was the first time of, the, of our, in our papers, of the, where there was a denial of atonement of cross. Before that, atonement of the cross had been affirmed, and Ellen White believed it from a young girl during the midnight, uh, during the advent, before the great disappointment. At any rate, uh, it was Jones and Wagner who, who first violated priesthood of believer principles, and we'll discuss that more detail later. But they were so eager to present their message that they got ahead of the Lord and failed to follow his counsel. And this resulted in a very serious crisis. But it was Smith and Butler who carried this on. It was Smith's denial of the atonement he was the one who, by the way, in the very year that Wagner began, J. H. Wagner began denying atonement at the cross, uh, Uriah Smith affirmed uh, atonement at the cross, and so did Ellen White at the same time. But Uriah Smith later became converted to J. H. Wagner's view, and it was Smith who took the lead in denying atonement at the cross. And this was a major factor in creating the conflicts that would come because so thoroughly did uh, Smith educate the denomination that everyone believed that, the to that there was no atonement at the cross. You understand, they were arguing that the atonement is in the sanctuary in heaven they were not denying the atonement. Their insistence was that the a cross only provided blood for the atonement. The fact is that this was a means of, of unwittingly belittling the atonement of Christ and the sacrifice of Christ. Later on, when Questions on Doctrines was written, Elder M. L. Andreasen charged them with, uh, with the omega of apostasy. And he did that on several counts. He charged them with, with uh, violating the principle of truth in several ways. And one was on the atonement, and the two major ones were the atonement and uh, the nature of Christ. Uh, we will have a chance to take a look at my book, Questions on Doctrines Revisited, later on. We'll deal with this at that time. But I want you to notice that it was Uriah Smith who, at that time, uh, convinced the organization, in spite of the fact that our early pioneers had taught atonement at the cross, 
Ellen White had believed it and did always believe it. Nevertheless, Uriah Smith convinced them that the atonement was only in heaven and not at the cross. And this resulted in the division that we're facing even now. And the, the specific argument today is a little different, but this is still, this historically, is behind the conservative liberal, uh, uh, what should I say, chasm, the conflict between conservatives and liberals within Adventism, in which both have have gone astray in, in ways that are serious. Now there was a second atonement issue involved that intensified the problem of legalism. And that was the view that justification covers only our past sins. And that's very serious. And it's a principle I would like to be sure that during this class period, you personally, if you've had this idea, have disabused your mind because it's a very serious problem. You see, atonement isn't just for sins, it's for sinners. Amen. And when we become Christians, give our hearts to Christ, we have two natures, not one. And those natures are going to battle within us. And that battle will last until the end. There will never be a time when the carnal nature will not war against the spiritual nature. And it's extremely important for us to understand that the atonement is for the sinner, not simply for the sin. So that even though we are converted and to get our hearts to the Lord and have a new experience, we still have a sinful nature. And we're still uh, going to be constantly tempted to selfish thoughts. Selfishness is the key to all sin. And if a person is selfish at all, they need the atoning grace of Christ. And the result of the idea of sin being only for the past leads a person to the sense that it sins themselves specifically. The action of sin is what separates us from God. Now what separates us from God is our own spirit which is in rebellion because self is in rebellion against love, the principles of love. So, as long as there is pride or selfishness, there is sin. Now, Ellen White said in 1900, manuscript 50, Christ as high priest within the veil, so immortalized Calvary that though he lives unto God, he dies continually to what? to sin. So he's still sacrificing himself then. Thus, if any man sin, he has an advocate with the Father. Now, Christ, our righteousness, is something that we must claim every day. And if we do not claim it, then we have only one righteousness to claim, and that is our own. And we will seek to be righteous enough for God to accept we will never be righteous enough for God to accept, but he will accept the righteousness of Christ. If we claim that righteousness, we're not claiming our own. As a matter of fact, in order to claim his righteousness, we must repudiate our own righteousness. You remember when Jesus was here, he gave the parable of the, of the uh, publican and the sinner. I mean, uh, the, the Pharisee and the publican is what I meant. When the Pharisee, beat, uh, the Pharisee looked up to God and said, God, I'm so grateful I'm not like other men. I'm not like this publican. And meanwhile, the publican was beating on his breast. He didn't dare even look up to heaven. And he said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And although King James has a sinner, in the Greek, the article is there, the sinner. Mm -hmm. 
and and so the only sinner that the publican was aware of was himself and the only when I truly face the reality of my sinfulness the only sinner I'll be aware of is myself when I come before God now I will be aware of other sinners from time to time but but in between me and God when I'm praying for cleansing I'm the one I will see as the need for his righteousness I want you to know that the cross and the sanctuary are one unit it says Christ so immortalized Calvary that he lives into God as he lives into God he dies continually to sin so Christ in the sanctuary in heaven is portrayed as actually dying daily in behalf of those who come to him he is doing so because he longs to give us his righteousness and to restore us to his character as you near the cross of Calvary this was just three paragraphs later and that whole section deals with the same thing as you near the cross of Calvary there is seen love that is without a parallel as you come with a humble heart you will find pardon for Christ Jesus is represented as continually standing at the altar momentarily offering up the sacrifices of the sins of the world so we need to see the cross and the heavenly sanctuary as a unit and we will see in later discussions that the issue of atonement in heaven is vital but it is not true there was no atonement on it was atonement at the cross that makes atonement in heaven possible I see it's time for us to close but I want to read this for it to you the religious services the prayers the praise the penitent penitent notice this is the penitent confession of sin ascend from true believers as incense to the heavenly sanctuary but passing through the corrupt channels of humanity notice corrupt channels this is penitent confession and prayers and praise to God passing through corrupt channels of humanity they are so defiled that unless purified by blood they can never be of value with God so we need his righteousness all the time not just for sins committed in the past but we need his righteousness today and always even as we pray we can only claim his righteousness thank you shall we pray uh, bow our heads thank you Lord for your many blessings we pray for your presence throughout this day we pray that we may know how to claim your righteousness and that we may trust in your righteousness and know that you have died so that we can live that you are our righteousness and intend through the Holy Spirit to abide in our hearts to transform them according to the principles of your righteousness in the name of Jesus amen, amen. Thank you, you're welcome God bless you <laughs>